Good evening, and welcome to the University of Birmingham annual meeting here in the fabulous Bramall Music Building. Uh, it's so good to see so many of you here, our partners, our friends, um, for an evening that I know will be thought-provoking, entertaining, and inspirational. So now, how better to continue uh, than to hear from an international leader in their field about how their time at Birmingham has inspired and shaped them. So I'm really pleased that we have Sandy Okoro with us tonight, and I extend a very warm welcome to Sandy, who's the Senior Vice President General Counsel for the World Bank Group and a law alumna of our university. Before joining the World Bank uh, in February 2017, she was General Counsel of HSBC Global Asset Management and Deputy General Counsel of HSBC Retail Banking and Wealth Management. Before that, she was Global General Counsel at Bearings. Sandy has received many awards, accolades. Uh, I mean, I would be here all evening telling you about them. <laughs> I'll mean, just give you a few examples. In March 2014, she was named the Guardian newspaper by the Guardian newspapers, one of 10 women who are changing the face of the city. In July 2016, Sandy was named as one of the 100 women to watch by the female FTSE board. And in November 2016, uh, she received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the UK's Black Solicitors Network. And most recently, Sandy featured in The Powerless 2019 as the fifth most influential and powerful black person in Britain. And her interests go way beyond the world of law and finance. In, for example, her role as governor of the Royal Shakespeare Company, uh, she continues to maintain her links with our region. And she's had an amazing day today. We haven't given her a moment's rest. She's been here the whole day with our students, with our academics, with our debating society, with interviews. And now she's here to address us. So Sandy, welcome. Good evening, everybody. Um, Thank you, Lord Billamora, and thank you, uh, Vice Chancellor Sir David Eastwood, for inviting me um, here today. I've had a wonderful day. I really have enjoyed every moment of it. I'm not in the slightest bit tired um, uh, because it's been such fun, and I am so proud of my university. Watching that, um, uh, the videos, and hearing um, the Vice Chancellor. Um, uh, talk about uh, what the university is doing is pretty amazing. I'm standing here and I can't see any of you at all, which is delights. So I don't know whether you're asleep, I don't know whether... I can hear you laugh though. So lots of that, so I know that you're still there and haven't walked out the room for the drinks at the end would be good. Um, I've really enjoyed meeting everyone today. I started off with um, the wonderful Institute for Global In Innovation and it was absolutely stunning. I, I heard so much, so many things I had not heard before. I had not heard um, about 21st century crime before. Um, and obviously that's a lot to do with technology, but I hadn't heard that phrase before. Um, I also hadn't heard about behavioral fingerprints before, where that is where um, criminal behavior um, falls into various patterns. And where you cannot uh, necessarily collect DNA, you can collect behavioral type fingerprints that are just as strong evidence as DNA type evidence. And in the sector I'm in, and in the development sector, where people can't always gather DNA evidence, there might not be the facilities, the facilities may be broken down, or they may be far away. This sort of evidence for police and for law enforcement is absolutely crucial. So I'm going to be sending some of my team to talk further uh, to that uh, global innovation um, hub, um, you know, very soon, because I think there's a lot of synergy in work uh, that we could do and look at there. So what a, what a, it's, you know, universities, universities like Birmingham here, the innovation and the learning is absolutely crucial. And um, although I was here many, many decades ago, um, you sometimes forget all that is going on in a university and, and tend to concentrate on what you're studying on. But today, wow, I was, I've been so impressed. 
and I have been inspired. Birmingham inspires and it continues to inspire. Um, when I was here, uh, when um, things were a little bit different, um, a little bit, um, but not too much, it wasn't that long ago. Um, so I have some really vivid memories. Um, and uh, walking around today, um, I went to the Students' Union, and I remember when I was a fresher, the Smiths were playing. Morrissey, anyone remember that? I was about this far away from Morrissey, it was wonderful. Um, Bad Manners and Buster Blood Vessel, uh, what a name, um, were, um, did our rag ball, and Relax by Frankie Goes to Hollywood was number one. And um, going back today, and it was called Founders Bar, and seeing all the changes, there were still some things that were exactly the same. The Guildhall smelt exactly the same <laughs> of food and hamburgers as it did when I was there. So some things change and others don't. Um, I went back to the law faculty, my faculty, um, and met some law students there. And that was a lovely, lovely exchange. But it reminded me of my time there as a student and sort of thinking, you know, my only um, thought there was to pass my exams and will I get a job and all that sort of thing. And then to think I'm back here today and will be giving this speech this evening was just sort of kind of blew my mind somewhat to realise, uh, you know, about my journey. And I always also went to my old room at University House that is now the business school and I found my old room. And uh, we went, it's now an office. Uh, we went in there and... Um, I thought, wow, you know, stories can tell a room, a, a room can tell a story as well. I was thinking, how many changes have happened, how many things have happened there? And, but the view out the room was exactly the same. The view of Old Joe, the view of the Guild, and it brought back so many memories. And I wanted to talk about what Birmingham University had inspired in, in me and my journey from here as a student to standing in front of you now. And as we saw, uh, on one of the slides. Education truly, truly transforms. So I thought of four key things. I learned more than four things at Birmingham, by the way. Just want to say, just want to say. But I sort of distilled them into four key moments and four key things. So please indulge me for a moment or two. I do have a timer there, but I'm not paying any attention to it whatsoever. Um, so um, as you heard, I've been very involved and still am as much as they allow me to be uh, with the Royal Shakespeare Company, uh, just literally down the road. Um, and I want to start with this quote um, from Hamlet. We know what we are, but know not what we might be. And I think that's so true when you walk in through the gates of the university. And one of the first big things I le learned is you are the decisions you make. And let me tell you this story. So let me go back a bit when I was eight years old and I was at school and the teacher went around the room and said, what does everybody want to be when they grow up? And I couldn't wait to give my answer because I thought it was a really good answer. I was really annoying then, I'm still annoying now, but I was a really good answer, I thought. And um, I was waiting for the teacher to get to me. And I thought there were some rather silly answers before the teacher got to me, like being a footballer or being a princess. And it was like, well, no one was going to be a footballer or a princess in my class, but guess what? It came to me and the teacher said, Sandy, what do you want to be? And I said, I want to be a judge. And she turned around to me and she said, I'm sorry, Sandy, but little black girls from Balham don't become judges. Oh, there was no ooh in and ah ring back then. It was, oh yeah, that's true. Um, <laughs> now those were different times, obviously, but still I was rather hurt by that comment. And I thought, well, you know what? If they don't, then they're going to now and you're not going to stop me doing that. And what do you know? You're a teacher anyway, you're not a judge. Um, <laughs> That's actually a very good point, um, even for an eight-year-old. Um, and sometimes I look back on that phrase and thought, wouldn't it be funny if I turned around and said, okay, I won't be a judge, I'll be Senior Vice President, General Counsel, World Bank Group instead, and whether that would have made more sense, I doubt it. Um, so I was very determined um, to do what I needed to do to become a judge. I'm not a judge, by the way, just in case anybody's wondering. Um, that's, a, that's maybe to come, who knows. But I, I, what, I was very determined uh, to, to achieve this. Um, so when I was doing um, my A-levels at school, and I was at a very different school by then, which was very encouraging, and said, you can do anything you want, they said to me, do you know what? If you want to go and study law at university, you're actually going to have to get good results and start to work, because I, I was a very lazy student. And so they said to me, maybe you should aim for something that's a little bit more achievable, because even back then you had to get really high grades to do law. So they suggested 
uh, that I come and do politics. And I got a place at Birmingham to do politics in the Muirhead Tower just across the road. Even though, so that was one blip in my sort of determination there. Um, because I really wanted to come to Birmingham. I came to the campus, I thought, I want to come here. And they will never take me to, <laughs> to do law on my predicted grades, so let me go and do what I can. Um, so I, I, I came and I got my place to do politics. Before term had even started, still in that freshers' week, I met a young man called Declan, Declan Jones, very handsome Irishman. Always wondered what happened to Declan. But anyway, <laughs> so Declan said to me, um, so what are you studying? You know, there were three questions in presses. What A-levels did you get, where are you studying, where you live? Everybody asked you the same question in the week. And I said, I'm doing politics. And he said, oh, I'm doing law and politics. Um, I said, oh, I wish I was doing law, I told him the story. And he said, why don't you come across to the law fac with me and see if you can get in to do it? Because I actually got good grades, I forgot to tell you that. I actually got really good grades. So um, had I been a crystal ball and could predict my grades, I would have got into the law faculty. So anyway, I went across and I met a professor called Jeremy McBride who was doing the law and politics course, and it was a new course. And he said to me, why didn't you apply for law and politics in the first place? And this is one of those dun-dun-dun questions. And I suddenly thought, my instincts tell me to tell him the truth. And I said, well, because my school, which was a very good school, thought I wouldn't get the grades. And you could, I could feel when I was saying that, it probably wasn't the right answer that he wanted to hear. And he said, oh, that is not very good. Um, they should have encouraged you more to do that. And they said, well, we only, I only have 10 places to do law and politics. You're the 11th. So I studied, and my career would not be today what I'm doing if I hadn't walked across with Declan, bless you Declan, wherever you are, and um, spoken to Jeremy McBride, who gave me a chance. And so that inspired me um, to make the best of my, and not have a blip again, which I didn't really, um, and to follow my instincts. And that being true to yourself, Sometimes saying something that you might think, I'm not quite sure that is the right thing to say to get me what I want, but it's what I feel is very important. The third thing I did when I was here was I found my voice in a way I had never found it before. And I found it in two ways. Um, the first one was through the debating society, um, which I joined and I loved, and I loved learning to debate. One of the things that uh, is very important about debating is it's, n it's not about your opinion, it's about making an argument. And the first thing they taught us was to make the argument on the side of the view you do not agree with. And that was priceless for me. And priceless as a lawyer, because you're supposed to go in and argue for your clients. You're not supposed to go in and argue for yourself. So whatever your beliefs are, whatever your thoughts are, you're supposed to be able to make an argument. And I learned that here at Birmingham through the Debating Society. And I found my voice. And then later on, um, at that time, apartheid was still very prevalent in South Africa. I was very active um, myself in sort of politics. And uh, there was a big debate about um, a bank, uh, Barclays Bank at the time, whether or not, they still are Barclays, by the way, whether or not they should come on campus because they had branches in South Africa. Um, and these debates were hot topic issues. And um, in the Student Union Hall, there was a, um, a, you know, the, the campus was very divided on whether or not they should come on campus. Um, I wasn't pro them coming on campus, and I remember standing up in front of everybody for the first time in my life and thinking, I have to say something. And I said, I don't want the bank on campus. Barclays, I love you now, by the way, if there's anyone from Barclays in the room. <laughs> I, I bank with you, my kids bank with you, you're fine. Um, but at, the, at that time, <laughs> when I was 19, I wasn't so keen on you, and um, I stood up and I said, I don't want to have Barclays on campus because they uh, have branches in South Africa. And if I was in South Africa, I wouldn't be able to stand up and say, I don't want branches of Barclays in South Africa. And I got a round of applause for saying that. And I made a point very clearly without even thinking about the point I was uh, trying to make. And I got a round of applause for that. And that kind of left me in a very good feeling that actually when you stand up with passion and you say what you think and you say it clearly, it's worth something. And that's, I first learned to do that at Birmingham. And so not staying silent and saying what you believe in was really key. And after that, you couldn't really shut me up. Um, so um, it was here in uh, these hallowed grounds of Birmingham University that I found my voice. And inspiring me to do other things later 
is to use my voice where other women don't have a voice in what I do now. There are so many women across the world who, for whatever reason, are voiceless. And I meet many of them when I go on my travels for the bank. And there, is a lot, there are a lot of challenges out there for women, from gender-based violence to female genital mutilation, etc. And to use you know, my fancy job title, because I'm not my job title, anyone can have my job title, but not everybody can have my voice. And to use, you know, if, if people say it's the senior vice president and general counsel of the World Bank Group, you, you get a platform, and I'm using that platform to say, we need to stop this, we need to stop gender-based violence, we need to stop FGM, we need gender equality, and I use my voice to say these things, and I learnt that here at Birmingham. And the fourth thing that I really loved and have learnt and have been got, uh, got very close to is the arts. Um, I uh, was not something I was very close to when I was at school, but here I, I really enjoyed, uh, had many friends from the, from the arts faculty, I went to many plays, I remember going to this wonderful performance of Equus, and it wasn't just because the leading man was very good looking and was naked halfway through, it was a very, very good performance, and I thought, wow, you know, theatre and the stage, and I hadn't really had much exposure to theatre then, was just amazing. Um, and I would try and go as much as I could to the RSC in Stratford to see performances. And now I am a governor, one of the governors of the RSC and used to be on the board and I just love my Shakespeare and I love all of that. And that love started here and the access that it gave. So it really started many, many wonderful things. And what I took um, away uh, from my studies as a lawyer was this passion for the rule of law. Um, and law can be a very dry subject when you're learning it as an undergraduate because there's a lot of brain dumping that goes down in terms of um, learning uh, the basics. But you are taught the importance of the rule of law. And this is something that is crucial for every single nation in every single country. And every single person in this world is the rule of law. And I learned that here first. It was drilled into us. Um, and you t I have taken that with me everywhere that I've been, and it's not something to be taken for granted in every single uh, country. And in relation to looking at many of the laws around the world, particularly those laws that um, affect women, um, has something that I've, I, I've been really, it's been really important to me. And um, the World Bank is a, is a politically neutral um, organization, so we have to be careful what we say and do. But we also want to promote change in this world and, and allow countries to be the best that they can be. So in my team, in the legal team, one of the things we've been doing is producing these compendiums. Um, so we produced a compendium on child marriage, we produced a compendium on um, FGM, and we produced a compendium on uh, domestic violence. So we produced three of those. Um, and all done by my team in their spare time. And it's very simple. The idea is, it's about the rule of law again. Let's name all the countries, let's take FGM, that have rules against FGM, female genital mutilation, on their books, statutes. And then let's just list it all out so everybody knows the law, so no one can say it is part of, you can do it, and then let everybody access that. Now, laws do not change cultural norms, but they do underpin the changing of cultural norms. And so seeing where all the laws are, seeing where all um, you know, the rights are, is really interesting when you look and then you see, but hold on, hold on, it's going on. These laws are not being enforced. And so these compendiums uh, are really important and we've been working with many organizations for change in these areas and we hope to produce a fourth one soon. So it's amazing what just something as dry as the rule of law and looking at things from a legal perspective can change um, society and cultural norms. And it is cultural norms and the law that go together. Um, the other thing that we're going to be doing, I, I like to call it a little, a little project that we want to do, is we want to, um, working with our member countries, um, my team and, and others, uh, to change all the laws in the world uh, that discriminate against women. And we're going to do it one country at a time, uh, we hope we've got uh, one particular country that's really interested in doing that. It doesn't cost an awful lot of money. It costs about one million US dollars to change the laws on the books. Um, and, you know, most of that is um, legal work. Um, and that's not a lot of money uh, in development terms. So we're looking for donors and sponsors to give us that money so we can get to work um, on that change. And our view is we cannot tell 
our member countries what to do, but we'll create the we will build it and they will come. And uh, we will have these instruments and if they want to come and change the laws, they will come to me and my team and we will help them do that. And I truly believe one by one, these countries will want to change um, the laws on their books. So my journey uh, was varied, but I did um, end up here um, in front of you today and being invited because uh, I have this fancy job title um, and work for a really interesting organization. I want to say a little bit about the bank because sometimes it's not really well understood what we do. Yes, we lend money to developing countries and yes, we do lots of big infrastructure, but there are lots of other things we do as well. And I went through my career, as you heard, I went through the city and did um, work in asset management and was a city lawyer. Um, but my pull towards, um, you know, development, towards rights, uh, towards making the, better, uh, the world a better place never really left me. So when I had the opportunity to go and work at the bank, I jumped in there very, very quickly. And it's really interesting to me to see how it brings together so many parts of um, uh, the world, really, in many ways, both in terms of people, um, and, but both in terms of every single, um, ev every single aspect of our lives. So there's academia in there. We do a lot of research, um, and a lot of uh, the gender research has come out in recent years has come from the bank. Um, there's a lot of innovation that comes from the bank. There's a lot of knowledge. So when our countries borrow from us, they don't just get the money, they get the know-how that goes with it. So we are a knowledge bank um, as well. So there are so many things that the bank does that is not always uh, very well known, but it's often been at the forefront of a lot of change uh, in the world and in society, particularly in terms of the research it produces. So it attracts curious people from all over the world. And I've never been anywhere that's had so many PhDs around. Um, I'm the only one without a real PhD. Um, and the bank kind of got that wrong when they uh, recruited me because they saw that I had a PhD and it wasn't until I got there they realized it was an honorary PhD. <laughs> now, it was a bit too late to do anything about it. Um, but we have so many PhDs and, and nearly everybody speaks at least three languages and has spent um, you know, at least a good chunk of their working life in a country that's not their home country. You really get that feeling of diversity and inclusion and knowing the absolute genius it can bring to the table. Um, and I'm a great believer in diversity and inclusion as well. I've always been a champion um, of that. And you can see it. You, you, the quality of diversity and inclusion, this is something I learned here at Birmingham as well, because there, was, there were people from all over the world studying all sorts of different things. You know, it was the first time that I really was exposed to many different things, including going to Manchester. I'd never been to Manchester until I came to Birmingham. And that seemed like a foreign country to me. And then I went to Liverpool. It just got better. Um, <laughs> but this idea of diversity and inclusion is really important. It's a passion of mine. Um, and um, seeing all of that diversity and inclusion really for the first time coming out of London and coming to Birmingham was just, you know, it did inspire me all through my career. And uh, when I was doing some work um, at the RSC with, I think, Erica Wyman is somewhere here, who's the uh, Deputy Artistic Director of the RSC. I worked with her and her team and some other colleagues on the board to look at um, diversity in, in casting. Um, and so that you had sort of race neutral, gender neutral casting. Um, and very recently, I was uh, back in the UK and I was watching uh, Les Miserables, the BBC production. And it was just wonderful to see David Oyuelo playing Javert. And before that, you had Troy and you had uh, someone black playing Achilles because it gives the opportunity for more actors to do more things. That's the point of diversity. If you really stick in a narrow line, you really don't get that variety that is really needed. The more variety you have in the room, the more different views you have in the room, the better outcomes you have. And we kind of all knew, know that from a diversity perspective and that perspective of academia. But when you get into the real world, that tends to narrow and narrow and narrow. And the bank is the first place I've been to where it's been opened out um, again. And I love that diversity of thought and that di diversity of uh, thinking. And I want to tell you a little bit of something that we're doing um, at the bank 
Um, well, let me tell you a few things that are very simple and some that are more complicated. So I am lucky enough to be able to go on what's called mission. Everybody else calls that a business trip. At the bank, we call it mission um, to make it sound uh, different uh, and way more important. Um, so we call going on mission. Um, and uh, that's part of my role is to go and see the projects we do and um, meet and greet officials and um, you know, uh, work out if there are any problems and how we can solve them. And um, I'm always fascinated by the really simple ideas to really complex problems that the bank comes up with. Um, so um, I was in uh, Liberia last year, and of course Liberia has suffered from a civil war and it's suffered from Ebola. So it's, it's very ravaged and it's, it's just coming out of being a fr fragile and conflict uh, zone. So one of the biggest challenges is a lot of gender-based violence and a lot of sexual violence against women in Liberia. So parents are very reluctant to let their girls go to school for very good reason. And the problem is in rural areas, what do you do? It's often a long walk to school. So the bank came up with a really simple idea of a mobile bus, a walking bus. So what they did is they gathered parents on a rotor and you picked up one child and then you picked up another and it was literally a walking bus because there's strength in numbers. And this really worked. Very simple ideas like this work. And now more children are going to school as a result. So it doesn't always have to be some very fancy infrastructure project. Another one that I really liked um, and was really inspired by uh, is mobile courts, very close to my heart. In, in rural areas, uh, people can't get to the court. Sometimes it can cost a month's salary to get to a court. So guess what? Rights are not enforced. Access to justice just isn't there maybe for logistical reasons. So instead of everybody going to court, which is what we hear, the courts come to you. So they introduced, and uh, with a justice project in Tanzania, these mobile courts where a magistrate and a van, literally a magistrate and a van, you know, a man in a van, magistrate and a van, came to the rural areas and dealt with those issues in the rural areas. And you, using technology, you would book your court uh, for whatever day, you would say what cases the magistrate needed to hear, and boom, boom, boom. And I, when I first went to see this mobile court, I was expecting some very fancy van or whatever. It wasn't. It was a really simple van with a table um, and some boxes. But it was dispensing justice in rural areas. And then we have more complicated things, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about this, which is our human capital index, which is really very interesting. So... What is the Human Capital Index? Well, we just introduced it uh, at the end of last year, and it's about investing in people. Because one of the things that we have recognized as a development organization is that if you don't invest in your people, everything else you do from a development perspective will eventually become null and void. But how do you measure the capacity of your, your people, the people in your country. So the bank has come up with this idea. It's full of economists, the bank, full of very lots, many more economists than there are lawyers, which is a real shame as far as I'm concerned. But they really look at data, and they looked at the data in each country, each of our member countries' own data, their own statistics they produced. And what they did is they looked at two key factors, which were health and education. And they said, from a child between the ages of zero and 18, when you look at the health and education outcomes, it gives you a number. And there are, now let me get this right, there are five factors within that they look at. Child survival, school enrollment, quality of learning, healthy growth, and then adult survival. So all those things tie in together. And that gives you a number between zero and one. And that's your indicator. And that says how much productivity you are getting out of that young person, given what you've put in, in relation to health and education. So the top uh, country was Singapore. And 0 0.88 was their score. What it means is that they're missing 12% of productivity in their people once they get to 18. So they put a lot in. It's only 12% they're missing. Um, so... So Singapore was number one. What was really interesting are the other countries. So for example, the UK was 16th. It's 0.78. So they are, there's 22% of productivity the UK is not getting for every single young person in the UK. So they could do 22% better in terms of productivity. And then, so my father was from Nigeria. Nigeria was 152. It was getting 0.34%. So it's missing out on 66%, if my math's right, not my strong point, 
of productivity from it. You can see that huge gap, and you can suddenly see how you need to invest in your people in terms of health and education. Because it's, they're not always the sexy topics that governments want to invest in. They like investing in things people can see so people can vote for them. But when you see what you're missing in terms of productivity in that number, it's quite amazing. And to, to get something that simple in terms of a human capital index is absolutely wonderful. So I'm inspired by all of that where I am now. And that journey from Birmingham to here and the inspiration that I had here as a student and now seeing where I am is amazing. I did not think my education here would take me to where I am now. And the love of ideas, the love of new ideas, the love of innovation is something that I learnt here at first and has never left me. So the coming back and meeting everybody and the Innovation Lab today was absolutely wonderful. And the great thing is that ideas are really important. They are bulletproof. No one can really do anything about your ideas and we need more of them and universities are full of ideas and they're full of people who wonderfully are paid to come up with great ideas and I loved all the innovations here because everything starts with an idea but what you do with it and how you can formulate it and how you can make it a reality is a bit of the luck of the draw depending on where you are and that's why places like here like the University of Birmingham, are really important, and why all of you are really important, because it doesn't stay in one group. Uh, the work that we do, yes, we're a development bank, but we are looking at more private sector involvement, we're looking at more academic involvement, we're looking at more public sector involvement, NGOs are really important to us. Everything, there's an intersection into everything, um, and that is really, really important. And unless we work together more to make these things a reality, um, they won't happen. And as it said, you know, no one can whistle a, sympathy, a symphony. You need the whole orchestra. So everybody needs to play their instrument and play their part. So I just want to wind up on something. And I want to just go back to the arts a bit because uh, often when we talk about uh, the future and often when we talk about artificial intelligence and all those other things, we forget the arts. Um, and I want to put out a plea there not to do that. The arts are very, very important. They hold up a mirror to society. They tell us what has happened before us, and sometimes they like to predict the future. But we learn so much from the arts, and I got my passion for the arts from here uh, at the university because I was open to so many different things and I saw many different things. Um, we really need to make sure that this is not forgotten in the innovation space. Um, you know, I love STEM, don't get me wrong, this is very important. But I think the arts alongside it are absolutely key. And sometimes when I look at the way the world is going and the way things are said and the way things are put, I often wonder whether there's this, this lack of the arts within everything we do is part of the reason for that. And when you look um, at some of the wonderful playwrights and some of the wonderful artists that are coming out from all over the world and you look at their work and you, work and you see what they're trying to say and what they're trying to tell us, um, it's very important because we all know what the artists and writers um, and uh, dramatists have told us over the years when we were not there and we read their work now. And I think very much of Arthur Miller's The Crucible, which told us an awful lot about McCarthyism. Um, and so many things that are there because you can hide it in the arts and you hold a mirror up to uh, society. And it's really important we keep that going and we do not uh, sacrifice that uh, for any reason. Um, so, um, you know, in the, in the land of Shakespeare, uh, it's very important that we keep that um, artistic challenge. So my, my challenge to you is to be constantly questioning, uh, to love the arts, to be inspired. And let me leave you with a quote from Shakespeare. Um, it, is not, uh, it is not in the stars to hold our destiny, but in ourselves. So it's up to all of you to make all these wonderful things a reality. I hope you're inspired. Thank you very much. <laughs>